All right. Good afternoon, class. Uh, today's lesson, we're going to be learning about rockets um, and a, a, a pretty general introduction to rockets. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is why do we build rockets? Why do we explore space in the first place? Does anybody have any answers as to why we explore space? Matt? To see what's out there. Okay, to see what's out there. New um, resources, things like that. Okay, there may be new resources, there may be new life forms out there, new places to inhabit. Natural human curiosity pretty much dictates that we wonder about what is out in the rest of the universe. Why else have we, have we explored space? Yes, Scott. To compare the origins of Earth to other rocks. Okay. Uh, to chart the uh, the development of our planet. What else? Yes. I got two. All right. First one is, uh, you know, we can get up there and we can throw up satellites and increase communication down here. Okay. And the other one is just because we can. Okay. These are all really, really good answers. Now. One of the main reasons for our, our increase in space exploration was the space race during the 1960s. Um, 1950, was it seven or nine? I always get 1957 and 1959. The Russians uh, launched Sputnik, um, which was the first artificial satellite. Uh, and as a result of that, the United States really stepped up their space program, and the Russians continued stepping up theirs. And by the end of the, the decade of the 60s, we had a man on the moon. Um, this was during the time of the Cold War, so we definitely did not want to lose, lose that space race to the Russians because the thinking at the time was that we can't let them win at anything. And certainly not something as potentially important as uh, dominance in space. Um, like we said before, natural human curiosity um, human humans are just we're just a curious a curious species, um, and we explore everything around us. And there's a lot to explore out in space. Um, one of the one of the biggest most important reasons we continue to explore space now is for real economic benefits. Things like satellites, like Aaron said, using satellites we can increase communication across the globe. Um, we can map the entire face of the planet, which we've already done like several times over. Uh, we can use it for navigation, uh, for GPS. Um, industry, a lot of people are looking into what can we fabricate in space or you know, on some desolate wasteland of a different planet that we can't do here. Um, people have experimented with building different things in space um, because it, you know, Zero gravity can have uh, it can have benefits to manufacturing. Um, medicine, lots of medicines have actually been invented in space. Uh, I don't know which which ones specifically, but there are there are medicines out there that have been developed in, in space labs. Uh, and tourism is another thing that's really starting to take off. Uh, I just read a couple days ago that I think it's Virgin Mobile or well Virgin Galactic rather um, is offering flights into space for uh, 200 grand a pop. Um, so that's, I mean, that's something that's actually happening like now. And that's pretty cool. Now, now that we know why we explore space, we're going to talk about how we explore space. How many laws of motion did Newton write? <coughs> three. three. There's three, right. Does anybody know the first one? Or the general idea of it? Is that the every action? Or it's not that one. No. Is it in objects? Objects in motion and less acted upon by. Right, right. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, and objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. Now, this is a very difficult concept to demonstrate inside, well, in the real world, basically, because there are always, always, always outside forces, especially like on this planet where there's gravity. Uh, gravity is constantly interfering, so it's really hard to demonstrate. You have to imagine pretty much the vacuum of space. Things that shoot off into space can go and go and go, uh, provided they don't you know, 
come into close proximity of any planets or suns or stars, black holes, um, they can go forever because there's that. That's does anybody know what this concept is talking about? I don't want to say it. I want to see if you guys know it. Yeah. There's a back. There's a vacuum. Yes, but that's not that's not what this law is is talking about necessarily. The concept I'm talking about is inertia, which pretty much means that once an object gets started, you have to somehow slow it down to stop it. It won't stop on its own. Likewise, if something is at rest, it's not just going to spontaneously start moving unless it is acted upon by an outside force. Does anybody know the next, the next law? This is kind of the, the least common one. Force equals mass times acceleration. Congratulations. Yes, that is correct. <clears throat> Force equals mass times acceleration. This, uh, this second law is you know, pretty simple. It, it takes the form of an equation. Does anybody know the difference between mass and weight? <clears throat> this is something that trips a lot of people up. Yeah. Weight is the effect of gravity on an object, whereas the mass is the amount. It's like the, like the amount of space that it takes up. Not the, not the physical space, but it's... Like, Does anybody know what the word he's looking for? The amount of what that it volume? has? Not volume, but these are all related terms. Density. Not density. Matter. There you go. How much matter it takes up. Um, for example, what do we measure mass in? Grams. Do we measure it in, what's that? Grams. Grams, or kilograms. Uh, I weigh, or I am made up of about, I think it's about 60. 60 kilograms of matter. Um, now, I, we can't. We have no way of expressing that in in pounds because pounds is actually a measure of force because it takes the the amount of matter we have, which is our mass, and multiplies that by Earth's acceleration or gravity, which is a type of acceleration. So, when you talk about weight, keep in mind you're talking about a measurement of force instead of mass. Sometimes they're, they're kind of difficult to separate in your mind. Many of you have probably heard that if you go to the moon, you're going to weigh a different amount. Is that true? Yes. Yes, it is true. You will weigh a different amount. Will you have a different mass? No. No, unless you've gone on a diet or anything like that. Um, because the amount of matter inside your body has not changed. However, what has changed is the effect of gravity or acceleration on your body. Because the moon is smaller, it has less gravity, so you accelerate less. Okay. Third law. This is one probably everybody knows. Every, uh, every reaction has equal and opposite, or every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Right. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now this is going to be the one we're going to talk about the most, um, because it really helps us understand how rockets are propelled. Um, now, if I were to have a skateboard, which I don't, and I were to just stand squarely on that skateboard with it, you know, going like this, so I could roll kind of forward and backwards like this, and I put my arms out like this, and then I just kind of go like that, am I going to stand still? Am I going to jump up? Am I going to go forward or backwards, side to side? What's going to happen to me on that skateboard? Okay, yeah, I'm probably going to fall. Imagine I have really good balance, and I can just go like that. And move backwards. Yeah, I'm going to scoot backwards. A lot or a little bit? A uh, little bit. Just a little bit. Uh, because what I've done is I've accelerated the mass of my arms out in front of me. So I created a forward force. Now, there's also going to be an opposing force, a reaction, in the opposite direction of equal magnitude, because um, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So the forces are going to be equal to each other. So since the, the mass of my whole body is much larger than the mass of my arms, the acceleration is going to be much less. So I'm just going to roll back a little bit, provided I do not fall. Now this is really important in uh, rocketry, because as this illustration here depicts, um, the force, the, the action of the explosion of the fuels mixing up and igniting is directed downwards. 
because inside that, that nozzle, there's a wall directing the directing all the, the gas and the vapors and the heat and all of the energy contained in that in a downward motion. Since we have an action that's downwards, we have an equal and opposite reaction that is going upwards, which propels a rocket up or forward if you're in space. Um, let's see. Like I touched on a little bit earlier, the force of uh, the explosion downwards and the force of the propulsion upwards are going to be equal. Even though the mass and the acceleration of each one is not going to be the same, the forces themselves are going to be equal. And as you can figure out, we use that force equals mass times acceleration equation to figure out how much fuel we need to explode and how fast in order to get a rocket into space. Uh, and we can kind of rearrange formulas so that, yeah, I wrote that right. Uh, first mass times first acceleration is equal to second mass times second acceleration. Oh, and that, that picture up there is the picture of a Newton's cradle, um, which is the, you know, the ball swinging back and forth, um, because every time that, you know, one swings forward, the other one flies out and comes back. Okay, who would like to name some types of energy. <clears throat> um, electric. Okay, electrical. What else? Yes. Heat. Okay, thermal energy we call that. Yeah. Solar. Solar energy, which is a type of what? What, what does it come from? I guess thermal. Okay. No, not, not thermal. Photovoltaic. Okay. What's that? Photovoltaic. It has a little bit more to do with the light. Actually, well, light energy. It kind of depends on which which one you're talking about. If you're talking about us making like solar cells, that would be more thermal energy. Whereas the light, the solar energy that plants get is derived more from the light that the plants receive. Um, so that we have in play there, we have thermal energy and we have optical energy, which is the energy contained within light. What else? This is some of the big ones. Fuel, coal. Well, okay, what, what kind of energy do we find in fuels? <clears throat> uh, combustion, chemicals. There you go, chemical energy. The energy contained within chemical bonds. There's one other, uh, actually there's two, two, and one of them is really, really big. You said kinetic, and that's, it's a type of kinetic energy. Mechanical. Yeah, mechanical energy. And the last one, which probably nobody's going to get, is the nuclear energy. Um, there are other ones, but uh, we don't have to talk about we don't have to talk about all of them. Gravitational. All right. Where do we see nuclear energy being used? <coughs> power plants. Okay, nuclear power plants. What about thermal energy? Where do we see that in action? Baggy pipes. Yeah, the baggy <laughs> pipes. Oh my God, I'm so glad those things are being quiet. Okay. Uh, any kind of heating element. Uh, for example, I, I use toasters. Um, what about mechanical energy? Where do we see mechanical energy at work? Cars. Okay, in cars. And I had the drive shaft of a car. Uh, what about optic energy? Where do we, where do we see that in use? Especially in the technological world. Communications. I, that's a really good one. Yeah, communication and fiber optic cables. I had lamps. Uh, but fiber optic cables is a very, very good answer. Chemical energy. Where do we see chemical energy at work? Battery. Did you say it, Dr. Hatter? Battery. You're right. That's what I had. Batteries. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, any fuels, most of those have are you know, full of chemical energy, uh, chemical potential energy. And thermal energy. I'm sorry, electrical energy. Where do we see that? In the lights. In the lights? <laughs> in the computers? In cell phones? Everywhere. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now that we've talked about what kinds of energy are out there, we're going to talk about how rockets use energy. And there are four main categories of rocket propellants. Uh, we have solid, liquid, hybrid, and ion propulsion. A solid propellant has, it, it's, it's basically a powder-based fuel, um, and it uses uh, oxygen from the atmosphere. It doesn't need to take and oxidize with it. Um, 
you can see these in Estes rockets. If any of you have launched model rockets, those are almost certainly uh, filled with a solid propellant. Um, now, solid propellant rockets are they're easy to make, they're cheaper to make. Um, however, there are some pretty big drawbacks to large scale applications like what NASA looks for. Um, chief among them is that you cannot steer uh, because it just it comes out the bottom. It can't be directed in any other direction. Um, so it would pretty much just go in a straight line, and you'd have to rely on gyroscopes and fins to to kind of direct which way you're going. Um, another big problem is that you can't adjust the speed. It cannot, uh, once you light solid fuel and it starts burning, it's going to keep going until it's depleted one of its fuel sources, whether that be the, the solid fuel itself or the oxygen in which it's burning. And the other problem was, oh, right, you can only use it inside of an atmosphere uh, because it, it needs oxygen to burn. Um, so that's really not very good for space travel. Uh, so we move on to liquid propellant rockets, which are much more complex uh, because what they do is they mix two different liquids together, and those two liquids are able to ignite, and then you know, and from there you have a, an explosion. Uh, now you have a fuel, which I believe is usually kerosene in a lot of NASA's rockets, uh, and you have an oxidizer which in this case is generally liquid oxygen, or LOX, as they call it, uh, which is O2 that has been, uh, it's been, the temperature has been dropped so low that it actually turns from a gas into a liquid. Uh, now, some of the nice things about liquid propellant rockets are that it, it pretty much solves all the problems of the solid <coughs> propellant rocket while creating a fuel zone. You can control velocity, I mean, you can control how fast it's going, um, you can make the engine stop, you can direct it in different directions, so you don't have to rely only on gyroscopes and fins to, uh, to change your direction. Yeah. Um, now, the drawbacks are that ignition becomes a little bit more, actually a lot more complex, because you need to freeze, well, you need to, uh, I'm sorry, condense the oxygen. You need to make sure that they're you know, completely, the two fuels are completely separate, otherwise they could just ignite inside the rocket and you don't want that. Uh, you need pumps, you need an ignition source, and if any of you have seen pictures of uh, like the Saturn V guts, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, also, Fuels can be a little bit corrosive, so at, over time, um, those can wear out. Now, this top picture here kind of combines or shows the uh, the complexity of a solid propellant rocket on this side and a liquid propellant rocket over here. As you can see, uh, the liquid propellant rocket, you know, it's got it's got a little bit more going on. Now, this is a very basic picture; it doesn't show you know everything that's happening right about there. Uh, but I mean. Even without that, you can see it's a little bit more complex. Um, here is the a cutaway model of an Estes rocket. All right, hybrid ro hybrid propellant rockets combine solid and liquid rockets, uh, and you know the properties of both. What they generally do is they will use a solid fuel and combine that with a liquid uh, oxidizer, still being liquid oxygen or LOX. Um, it still needs an ignition source, uh, but it doesn't need to keep two fuels, you know, well, two liquid fuels separate. Um, you can still control, uh, you can still control thrust, you can still control direction. Um, however, they're, they aren't always the most powerful rockets, um, so that's something that, that they have to keep in mind. Now, the fourth type, uh, is the oddest type. It's, it's probably my favorite though. Uh, and it's an ion rocket. It doesn't actually use chemical reactions. Um, what it does is it actually uses mechanical energy, unlike the other three using, um, uh, I'm sorry, chemical energy that's then converted to thermal. 
Um, now what a ion rocket does is it takes negatively charged ions, which are, you know, one atom. Um, I, I, I would think that a lot of them are pretty much just hydrogen atoms without the electron, so that they have a charge, which would be a positive charge. Uh, and they take those, those ions and they accelerate them out the back of the rocket with an electromagnet. They can get these ions going really, really fast. Uh, generally with particle acceleration you can reach like 98% of the speed of light. It's really fast, uh, which is you know, basically the, the point. You need them to go really fast because what is the mass of an ion? Is it big or is it small? It's very small. It is infinitesimally small. So you need a lot of them and you need them to be going very fast. Even with that, uh, it does not generate a lot of force. Um, for that reason, it's only used in deep space applications. Uh, yeah, it's only used in deep space applications and even then, uh, I read that it can take about three days to accelerate like zero to 60 when it's you know, firing on, all, on full. Uh, and it's useless inside of, a, uh, inside of any gravity well. Now, the gravity well is you know, kind of the, the area in which a planet or a star's gravity is you know, an important factor. So we can use it in deep space. It takes a long time, but uh, the fuel weight is, you're hardly using any fuel at all. And once you get up to speed, you can pretty much shut off the engine and uh, it'll you know, keep coasting for however long. Um, one, we, I believe the United States only has one ion rocket in, in use as of now, um, and that's, it's some, you know, uh, not, it's, I guess, a satellite that's in really, really deep space. Uh, the application that most of you are probably more familiar with is the TIE Fighter from Star Wars. TIE actually stands for Twin Ion Engine, it means it has, it has two ion accelerant engines. Um, and it, it, sometimes they show this in the movies and they really shouldn't. TIE fighters can't operate within, within a, you know, a gravity well. So you're not going to see them like, flying directly overhead. They're only going to be in deep space. Does anybody have any questions? No questions? How do I build a TIE fighter? What's that? How do I build a TIE fighter? How do I build a TIE fighter? <laughs> And then I have, I have a review, should we, do you want to go over that or? Uh, you're probably good. Okay. Who wants to name three types of energy? Scott. Nuclear, electrical, and mechanical. Very good. Uh, what type of rocket do you think is the most practical and useful? Liquid. What's that? Liquid. Liquid propellant? Okay. Uh, what is the equation that we find in the second law of physics? Very good. What concept did we talk about in Newton's first law? Inertia. 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 And we just talked about that. Okay, and then I have I would have homework for the kids, which I am rather fond of. But 